Good evening. Uh, my name is John Panolfino. I am the current president of the ANMS, and it's my privilege to welcome you to the ANMS virtual symposia on functional abdominal pain, uh, better together bridging the divide uh, between pediatrics and adult GI disorders. It's also my honor tonight to introduce our moderator. Dr. Kimberly Herr is a clinical lecturer in gastroenterology at the University of Michigan. She specializes in neurogastroenterology and her current research focuses on the overlap between gastrointestinal diseases and psychological disorders. In particular, she has an interest in avoidant and restricted food intake disorders and what role that plays in GI populations. So without further delay, Dr. Herr. Thank you, Dr. Pendolfino, for that wonderful introduction. And good day, everyone, and welcome to the ANMS Monthly Virtual Symposia Series entitled Better Together, Bridging the Divide Between Pediatric and Adult GI Motility Disorders. Topics presented as part of this series have included gastroparesis, constipation, and neuromodulation. But today, we shift our focus to functional abdominal pain. We are honored to have three leaders in this field joining us today, Dr. Miguel Sops, Dr. Doug Drossman and Dr. Miranda Van Tilburg, who have each helped shape our current understanding of the diagnosis and treatment of functional GI disorders. A few quick housekeeping items. All viewers' mics and video are turned off, so don't worry, sit back and relax. Um, please enter all questions you have in the Q&A box. It would be helpful if you would also let the speaker you would like the question directed to, just put that uh, name in the submission as well. The chat box can be used for general discussion items, but all questions directed to a panelist um, should be put into the Q&A box. If we don't have time this evening to answer all submitted questions, those additional questions that are unanswered will be answered in docmatter.com, which is an ANMS member benefit. This platform can also be used if you're watching the session at a later date. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker for this evening. Dr. Miguel Sops is a chief of, chief of the Division of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition at the University of Miami Health System. Dr. Sops is a professor of pediatrics and also serves as the George E. Bachelor Endowed Chair in Pediatrics. Dr. Sops earned his medical degree at Hospital Pereira Rosel, Facultad de Medicina, and Montevideo, Uruguay. His research interests include pediatric functional bowel disorders mm -hmm. and gastrointestinal motility. Dr. Sops will be speaking today about the approach to kids with functional abdominal pain. Dr. Sops. So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, okay. So these are my disclosures, but none of them is relevant to this talk. And in the next few minutes, we'll talk about some particular aspects of the care of children with abdominal pain. And you will realize that some of them, they are common to adults, but also there are certain particularities that are important to uh, highlight. And we try to do it based on evidence-based medicine. Uh, as I know that all of them, all of us try to, uh, to practice the best medicine that there is. And we'll touch about a uh, different aspect of the brain gut axis. Some of them are, uh, again, relevant to pediatrics and some of them relevant to all of us. So if you go to a school, uh, either in Pittsburgh or Chicago, where they have done studies, and uh, you ask children whether they have pain, every single week, you're gonna find that 32 to 46% of children will have at least one episode of abdominal pain. And there is something interesting in pediatrics. If you look at the intensity of pain, and these are, you can see in the x-axis, the month of the year, and the y-axis intensity, you can tell that there is a trend in which there is more pain in uh, winter months than summer months. And not only there is more pain, but also the outcomes of treatment of children differ between winter and summer. In this, uh, um, in our amitriptyline study, you, in this sub-analysis, you can see that children did worse those that were recruited during winter months than those that were recruited during summer months. And that in part explains why we see this pattern of consultation that you can see in this uh, figure, in which there are more consultations during winter months or during school year than during summer months. And I think that's of particular interest. Uh, of interest. But however, that wasn't shared by everybody. A few years ago, I had a single topic symposium in New Orleans 
And one of the adult GI, one of the experts say, no, that what you're saying is not true. We just don't see this uh, pattern. Okay, I didn't take it lightly. I didn't like it too much, and, uh, but data is data. I, I was very confident of our data, but I say, let's see what happened. So we repeat the studies, and then we did another study comparing adult with pediatrics. And what we found is that both of us were right. There was no pattern uh, in, in adults, but there was a pattern of consultation in pediatrics. And I think that's very interesting. Because in a session like today, in which you are bridging the gap between adult and pediatrics, I think these uh, issues are very important if we put our minds together to better understand the biopsychosocial model. And in particular interest because ANMS and the European society uh, in this, uh, the tax force in this curriculum, what they say is that even adults should know about pediatrics and should try to put in perspective when you see an adult patient, what happened early in life. And the same thing uh, was said in the counterpart, uh, NASPIGAN, in the uh, curriculum of pediatrics. So how does he apply for the brain gut axis? So obviously we cannot cover everything in a few minutes, but let's cover some, uh, some issues like sleep, stress, diet, and microbiome. So if you, if you have children or you had, you know that children, they sleep less during the school year because they have a rigorous curriculum. Many of them, they do uh, extracurricular activities and then they don't have so much time to sleep. That happens in the US, happened in China. And that, uh, that the decrease of hours of sleep, it's important because if you don't sleep very well, you're not gonna deal very well with the pain on the next day. But also if you look at children with chronic pain, any pain, 39% of them will have sleep disturbances. So this is a model in which the chicken and the egg, they feed each other. I don't know who feeds whom, but chronic pain and sleep are clearly linked together. And now if you throw there uh, the affect and uh, the disability of these children who may not be able to uh, practice all their activities or go to school, or um, then it becomes even more interesting. And we're gonna hear from Miranda and Tilburg uh, in the next few minutes. And what happened is that these children who have more chronic pain, they have comorbidities similar to adults. In pediatrics, more than 50% of children who have uh, abdominal pain will have headaches. And this is important because if we just improve the pain, the belly pain from seven to five, we may be very happy, but the quality of life of a child who has severe headaches is not gonna improve. So it's important to take out history. Also, we are all aware of bullying and 10% of children in the US are bullied. So that can explain some of the factors in the school year. But also, if you look what happened in this Chinese study, children, they felt bullied by the teacher and by the uh, rigorous curriculum and the, activity and the homework that they have to do. So all aspects that we need to cover when you take the history of a child. We went to Colombia, we did some, stu some studies to see what happened with the stress. And obviously we found that there was academic stress, but interesting, we found that uh, family stress in children with abdominal pain was different than uh, their controls. And that's particular, that's of great importance. And again, we need to look at all these things when we take history. And as we have learned from Miranda and from others, <clears throat> the relation between the children and the parents is important. Some of them, they catastrophize and those and maybe do worse. And it's important when you take uh, the, the, the history in the room that you look at the relation between the mother and the child to ask whether the mother had functional disorders too, and see who talks, if the child is allowed to talk or just the mom uh, is giving the history. And, and stress is linked to physical activity and children who have pain, they may, uh, may not be able to do all the physical activities so they may miss gym or uh, other social activities. And what's important is that stress and physical activity, uh, inactivity, it's not only uh, important at the time, but also it's a prognostic factor with children who have stress and physical inactivity being worse even three years later. So we look at stress, we, again, we can see that abdominal pain, headaches are more common, very much uh, five times more common in children who are stressed, but also other comorbidities. And but two, whether they're lonely or sad, what's very important, and that's why it's so important to practice integrative medicine. And then this is just to challenge your uh, thoughts, but we did this study in which in, uh, in Orlando, in which we look whether the microbiome that we thought may be affected in the school year, children are close, close together, they get infections, they eat together, many other factors may affect the stress, uh, and the microbiome differs 
between children with abdominal pain and those who controls within winter and summer months. So more to come. This is just a preliminary data, but I think it's interesting. What happened with the diet? We're all aware of FODMAPs and fructans that may uh, trigger symptoms. And then we did this study in Argentina looking at uh, to see what happened if we modify the diet during the school year. And what we found is that so to our surprise, the children who had a history of abdominal pain were not more likely to have abdominal pain, to trigger abdominal pain by high fruit and diet, uh, high FODMAP diet. So again, this speaks about the uh, interfactorial, the multifactorial nature of this disorder that we still need to uncover. So how does it affect our practice? How can we put in practical terms? Because all of us at the end, what we want is the best for our patients. One of the things we need to learn uh, to teach to uh, our younger generations is that we cannot do things like this study. Like in this study in Korea, they gave, medic they gave vignettes to medical students and they saw, and they, they just let them take the history. And what happened, they interrupted the patient after four seconds. So can you imagine how much a kid can articulate if you give them only four seconds to tell you what they, what's bothering them? And it gets worse because this, this uh, the second question that wasn't open-ended, we they interrupted the patient in two seconds. So this is something that Dr. Drosma has taught so much in adults, also applies in pediatrics that we need to take a good history and be good communicators. Because in the, we cannot, although we are oppressed for time by our administrators, we need time to see these patients. We cannot touch the computer for a couple of minutes. We need to look at the eyes of the patient. We need to ask questions like, how can I help you? Open-ended. We need to listen. We need to be patient. And one of the important questions that I ask is, what worries you? And let me tell you why. The first patient I saw when I moved to Miami, I was a patient referred from New York, and then I was called by the uncle telling me, I'm a pediatrician. My uh, niece has abdominal pain. Can you see her? I say, yes. And then I ask her that question. And I say, what worries you? And she said, I'm an actress from Broadway. And for the last few months, I, you know, when I go on stage, I get belly pain and then I had to run to the bathroom and I had to stop acting because I cannot be in custom for three and a half hours if I have belly pain. And that shows how important it is to take a good question because we're gonna get a lot of surprises. And if this kid, if we just have improved the pain as the uh, uncle told us, her life would be equally miserable if she cannot act. She was a, a, a prodigious actress. So what do we need to do? We need to tell the patients, that the children that we believe in them, that it's not in their head. And we need to say that. We need to re-educate, tell them that this is common because frequently they are lost. I, I, we need to reassure that we know exactly what it is, that we have treated many of these and they get better. And some questions are similar in adults and pediatrics. This study that Dr. Drossman did a few years ago before Google told us everything about medicine, uh, some of these may not apply now, but patients want to be listened, want to be supported and wanted hope. And that's important. One of the messages they have to get from our, our uh, consultation, and we cannot waste that consultation, is that today start the road to recovery. Let me tell you what happened with this patient. She came back a few weeks later after seeing 11 GI doctors across, uh, throughout the country and getting stool studies every week for some reason that I cannot understand. She was never told what she had. She came back and she was almost perfect. And I asked her, so what happened? Like you have seen so many doctors. What, I use the same things that everybody else use. Say, what was different? And she told me, you gave me hope. So this is very important. We, we need to give hope to our patients. We, need to, we cannot waste the opportunity to be great placebos. This study that was done with uh, Sam Nurko and Carlo and other friends from uh, Columbus, in which we, it's a crossover study, open label placebo, and we allow them in the other arm to take um, anticholinergic as a standard of care. What happened, obviously, as no surprise, uh, placebo was much better than anticholinergics, but also the patients were not taking the anticholinergic because they believed so much in the placebo. So we need to be great placebos. Part of the things we do is just to be the best placebo we have. And then we need to adapt our consultation to each particular patient. Each situation is different. But what's not different among all patients, among all consultations, is that we need to educate. We need to engage them in our consultation and we need to empower them. 
We need, to, we need to act with empathy, but also sharing the responsibility. We need to tell them we cannot do it alone. They have to own their disease or their disorder. And they have to try to help themselves and work as a team. And obviously, and always, we need to have a warm and friendly and reassuring manner in our consultation, because that has been shown by research that this is the best way uh, to improve our patients. So at the end, how can I summarize? We need to use the best possible evidence of all the studies that we know and we published, but then we have to combine with the art of medicine. And we need to adapt to that particular situation, to that child, to that family. And this, I'm going to share with you with the permission of, the, of this child and with the family and the family that allow me to share this. This is a patient I told you. She's back to acting. She's filming every year a movie. But not only that, she's now an advocate for children with abdominal pain. She now, she's, she has her own Instagram, and I invite you to, uh, to look at it and to um, to look at her story, in which she now she's made her mission to help other children and to tell what IBS means because she was never told that she had IBS before. So with this, I'm going to stop here and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sops, for that wonderful and informative presentation. Very inspiring. Next up, we have Dr. Doug Drossman. Dr. Drossman is trained in gastroenterology and psychiatry and is an internationally recognized scientist, clinician, and educator in DGBIs and communication skills training. He is the founder, former president, and current COO of the Rome Foundation, professor emeritus in medicine and psychiatry at the University of North Carolina, was the principal investigator on several NIH-funded studies, has written over 500 peer-reviewed scientific articles and published 15 books, including most recently an educational book for patients entitled Gut Feelings, Disorders of Gut-Brain Interaction. Dr. Drossman will be discussing central neuromodulators for function of functional abdominal pain. Dr. Drossman. Thank you, Kim. It's so nice to be here. I want to take you through where we are now in using neuromodulation for errors of gut-brain interaction. Terminology may be new to some of you, but I think it'll become apparent as we go. Um, we're talking brain-gut axis, and there is no other organ system as closely linked to the brain, so hardwired as the gut. And that's because in the formation of the embryo, and you have the neural crest, there are ganglia down from the somites down to the endoderm, the midgut and the hindgut. And that's what's called the enteric nervous system. So what we do in the brain for patients with psychiatric conditions, we may do in the gut, in the, in the spinal cord and the enteric nervous system. And this is what it's all about. This is the brain-gut axis. The uh, gut communicates to the brain by neural and endocrine and inflammatory pathways, and the brain communicates through the autonomic nervous system. And it has such profound effects on motility, secretion, dysregulation of tight junctions, leading to transmigration of bacterial products, causing visceral sensitivity and other uh, factors relating to motility. Because of this, uh, the Rome Foundation has changed the terminology from functional GI disorders to disorders of gut-brain interaction. Because the reality is that patients with these disorders represent any of these combinations, uh, altered motility, visceral hypersensitivity, altered mucosal and immune function, altered gut microbiota, and altered CNS processing. And so when we talk about all of these parameters, I want to recommend to you this uh, uh, Rome working team that came out uh, in 2000, December 2018, where we went through an evidence-based review and made consensus recommendations. And a lot of what we'll talk about today comes from this article. 
First thing is that we are now talking about gut brain neuromodulators, just like we talk about disorders of gut brain interaction. And the reason why we're doing that is that the term antidepressants and antipsychotics and anti-anxiety agents, well, they really began in the 50s and 60s when these drugs were targeted for treating psychiatric problems. But with neurogastroenterology and brain-gut interactions, we borrow those drugs and use them to re-regulate the brain-gut axis. So we have central neuromodulators, antidepressants and all these, and we have peripheral neuromodulators. The drugs you're using for constipation and diarrhea are peripheral neuromodulators. And as I said here, we think that this will make it more credible to patients and doctors and reduce stigma. Uh, so here we are, the central neuromodulators, we're not going to cover all this, but are the antidepressants, which are the dominant ones, the atypical antipsychotics, which is the ones that our group have been most interested in and is starting to get more traction, much like it's used in psychiatry for augmenting augmentation of pain and other GI functions, uh, the azapurones, uh, in some cases, the anticonvulsants, and you may be familiar with the NMDA agonists, like dextromethorphine, ketamine, and memantine. The peripheral neuromodulators would be the, the delta ligands, uh, the serotonergic agents, and the chloride channel agents or secretagogues. Uh, opioids are also neuromodulators. So why do we use these agents? Well, first of all, they can treat comorbidities, psychiatric and brain gut disorders that have pain. They have peripheral effects they improve the, pain's pain the brain's pain regulation, and they may have a neurogenetic effect as well, which allows you eventually to take them off the antidepressants, uh, and they may, not, they may be better. So here's the brain-gut axis. Here we are. The signal goes from the uh, gut to the brain, and then the brain has the capability to receive and modulate this. This led to the this concept of the brain-gut axis was the Nobel Prize in 1964 by two psychologists, Melzack and Wall. But the idea of a brain-gut model really occurred 20 years earlier during World War II when an anesthesiologist named Henry Beecher was on the Anzio beachhead uh, during World War II and noticed that the soldiers who were wounded on the battlefront did not need morphine requirement. They weren't reporting pain. When they went back to the hospital at the base, the morphine requirement went up and the pain went up. And he hypothesized that something's going on in the brain while on the battlefield, maybe it was the threat of death or getting away back, safety back to the hospital, but it, it affected the pain experience. And now we know it's a two-way street. It's not just what happens here, but it's what the brain does to gate or block the pain. In addition to that, we have the concept of central sensitization, that when pain continues repeatedly, it may lead to an amplification of the signal going from the dorsal horn to the brain. That's a wind-up phenomenon in laboratory animals, which leads to greater signaling going to the brain. So paradoxically, repeated motility or inflammation or sensitization here can lead to a more chronic state. And that's why we see patients historically who may begin with occasional pain, IBS pain, and then 10, 20 years later, they have chronic pain. And this is modified by brain factors, the psychosocial context, expectation and conditioning. Well, that's placebo effect. The, the, if it's positive expectation and positive condition, that's placebo. If it's negative, it's nocebo. So a patient who's had a bad experience with a medication may then never want to go on that medication or any other medication like it. And if they do, they get side effects. And then there are the cognitions, which we'll hear about later from Miranda, that can affect the pain experience and the pain behavior. And this can lead to structural changes in the brain and the spinal cord and even in the gut that can be leading to a neuroplastic situation where you can have 
disruption and degeneration of brain cells, or you can have enhancement and growth. Now, just to point out, when we talk about chronic pain, which is often a target, uh, like central abdominal pain here, and we compare it to uh, IBS, IBS people have a lower pain threshold to distension, but normals shown here that, uh, are, no diff are, different, are no different from chronic pain because what it's saying is the pain is not coming from visceral sensitization at the level of the gut. It's coming from central sensitization at the level of the brain, but there are peripheral effects. So when you choose your antidepressants, you want to look at whether it's predominant neuroadrenergic or serotonergic effect, because the tricyclics, which have neuroadrenergic, slow down the gut. And so even for controls in IBS, you have increased orocecal transit time. Conversely, serotonin, where there's most of serotonin's in the gut, not the brain, leads to enhancement of secretion and motility and orocecal transit time is reduced, meaning that you have diarrhea, whereas here you'll get more constipation. And even the pain signaling is related to antidepressants, tricyclic shown here, that as you increase the dose of, uh, this is in, in rats, where you uh, looked at afferent nerve discharge by bathing it in an antidepressant, you find that the increased dose leads to reduced afferent discharge. So you're getting pain reduction even at the level of the gut. Uh, we don't have a lot of time to go through this, but you know about the monoamine theory that basically you, um, by using these uh, antidepressants or other neuromodulators, you can re-allow, uh, prevent, re uh, you can increase reuptake, that is reduce reuptake, leading to accumulation of neurotransmitters at the synaptic cleft causing receptor downregulation, and then you can get uh, increased neurotransmitter activity. There are classes that use different receptor activation. The tricyclics are the dirtiest drugs, histaminic, noradrenergic, serotonergic, uh, muscarinic, alpha adrenergic, and that's why they have a lot of side effects. Conversely, SSRIs are purely serotonergic. They're very clean as are the SNRIs, and those can just can affect health pain, but they don't have a lot of side effects. And, and as you see, mirtazapine, meanserine, the other neuroadrenergic and specific serotonergic antidepressants are also dirty drugs with a lot of side effects. So I've demonstrated this here. When you want to treat pain, you're looking at neuroadrenergic and serotonergic effect and you wanna reduce the side effects shown on the right. So if you use a tricyclic, norepinephrine, serotonin, you get increased activation, but you have the risk of dry mouth, blurred vision, constipation, and the like. Whereas the SNRIs, like duloxetine, can give you this effect, but without these side effects. The main side effect is nausea. The SSRIs do not have, are clean drugs, with serotonergic effect, but they do not have neuroadrenergic effect. And when you're treating pain, particularly abdominal pain, you need to have activation of both of these receptors. And so this is just summarizing the side effects that you would see tricyclics shown here, SSRIs here, and SNRIs here. So which drugs are we talking about? What are the central neuromodulators? So you can have, in addition to these agents, you can have mirtazapine, which is the more complex. We often use that for nausea, anorexia, weight loss. It can also treat diarrhea. It does cause sedation and can cause weight gain. Clonidine we don't typically use, but it does have alpha 2 adrenergic agonist activity, which leads to central anxiety reduction and it also can reduce diarrhea uh, uh, and pain. Uh, and, and this is what we often use when we're preventing the adrenergic activity of detoxification with opioids. And buspirone is an augmenting agent used for anxiety and psychiatry, but it also has serotonergic effects on the stomach leading to receptive relaxation. And we think about that 
for postprandial distress syndrome. As I said, uh, we had been interested in the atypical antipsychotics because they're actually quite safe. Uh, I know there's been a lot of anxiety about using them, but they actually really are quite safe medications uh, within psychiatry and medicine and GI as well. They have multiple effects. They were originally approved for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder in high doses of 600 to 800 milligrams or 60 to 80 with olanzapine but they have other effects in low doses. So with one tenth the dose, which is what we usually use, you can normalize sleep architecture better than the hypnotics that you get over the counter or, or the other prescription medications. You can augment the benefit of psychiatric conditions and for chronic pain and olanzapine also is, we use for reducing nausea and vomiting when mirtazapine is not help, helping. Side effects of this class of antipsychotics is sedation and somnolence. You can get metabolic syndrome in high doses. Uh, the opioids we're not going to talk about except to say don't use it. There's absolutely no evidence that treatment with opioids leads, has any benefit in these disorders, and they do can lead to OIC and NBS. So how do you use it? Well, if I gave this talk, 10 or 15 years ago, I'd say we use them for severe chronic pain and disorders of gut-brain interactions along with psychological intervention and a multidisciplinary approach. But guess what? The data is starting to show we can use it in more moderate treatments. It's relatively safe and it works to improve, improve global rating scores and pain. And we have to think about it in terms of the severity of the condition. We don't want to use it for everybody, someone who has mild IBS or, or um, painful syndromes, because when we're treating with, let's say, IBS, you're dealing, for the most cases, of mild to moderate IBS with afferent excitation. What you've got is increased signaling at the level of the gut due to FODMAP, Distench, causing distension, uh, visceral hypersensitivity, dietary mucosal immune factors, uh, and so uh, constipation, diarrhea. And so we use gut-related medications. But as the condition gets more severe, we're now dealing with a failure of the brain to downregulate these incoming visceral signals. We call that disinhibition. And that can be motivated by a lot of psychologic factors. And then we move on from the gut medications to the central neuromodulators, including behavioral interventions that Miranda will talk about, antidepressants, and augmentation, which is the next level, which is combining medications. Um, I'm going to skip this for the sake of time. I just want to point out that when you work from mild to severe to CAPS, centrally mediated abdominal pain, you're moving from predominant gut activity to predominant CNS activity, and the treatment has to follow that. So what are the chronic pain conditions in the Rome 4? Well, you have them right here. Functional chest pain, heartburn, uh, EPS, CVS, bowel disorders like IBS, biliary pain, centrally mediated abdominal pain, narcotic bowel syndrome, and functional anorectal pain. So the first line drugs would be the TCAs for those conditions. Uh, there is one paper that talks about 10 milligrams. That was a very flawed paper. I would not recommend, although everybody does it, if you're getting a 10 milligram effect, you're getting a placebo effect. You need to get some activation at 25 to 75. In our NIH study, we were using up to 150. But these have the most convincing evidence of benefit. You start them on one of these doses and you can increase the dose, providing they don't have side effects. The secondary amines, uh, like disipramine and nortriptyline, have fewer side effects than the tertiary amines. So amitriptyline and amipramine, low doses can give you a lot of dry mouth and constipation, where these won't do that as much. So we tend to favor uh, these secondary amines to reduce the side effect benefit. 
SNRIs, uh, very effective. The data is not all there in GI, but by association and by knowledge from psychiatric, uh, we know that they can be very effective with fewer side effects. The SSRIs are not helpful for chronic pain per se in the gut, but they can help uh, in esophageal disorders, which I'll come to, uh, but they can help if constipation is present because they're serotonergic. So as I said, the SSRIs have shown benefit for esophageal and functional chest pain, a coexisting anxiety depression. If you have someone who has high levels of anxiety, you can use an SSRI in low dose, even with a tricyclic uh, or with psychologic treatment. For, for uh, functional dyspepsia, we look at um, uh, motility defect because you have a failure of receptor relaxation. So we talk about using buspirone, uh, which causes receptor omertazepine. Here's the data with buspirone showing a much better reduction in the dyspepsia score compared to buspirone. And mirtazapine, this was a study looked at patients with uh, mostly pain who had weight loss. You can see a reduction in the dyspepsia score in the mirtazapine and even weight gain. And epigastric pain syndrome is more like a painful disorder, whereas this is more motility. And so here, the study that um, showed the benefit was uh, Nick Talley's multicenter study at Mayo which showed that there was significant effect of a tricyclic antidepressant. But as I said before, the SSRIs didn't work. They were not no different than placebo. So getting to the end, we want to talk about augmentation treatment. When a drug is not giving you benefit or you're getting side effects, drop the dose a bit and add a second drug, a second medication or a second treatment, even a behavioral treatment, because you're working at different targets. And this slide uh, kind of demonstrates the first line treatments here, the TCAs for pain, uh, the tetracyclics for nausea, vomiting, the SNRIs for pain, SSRIs for anxiety. When it doesn't work or you get side effects, you go into the uh, atypicals or psychologic intervention. And, and I refer you back to this paper. Uh, very important is relapse prevention. When you put them on a drug, just like in psychiatry, if you stop the drug in three months, they'll relapse. But if you keep them on it for a year, they, the likelihood is 60, 70% they won't relapse because we're dealing with a neuroplastic effect where we may be rewiring the system. And this is what you tell your patients, you keep them on it, so eventually you can take them off it. Pharmacogenomic testing uh, is an option. We use that in about a third of our patients to help us decide which drugs might be better based on the metabolic profile. And then lastly, what's important is not what you do, but how you do it. And just a few bullet points, listen actively to their complaints, state the diagnosis and give a clear explanation so that you can give a physiologic explanation of the brain gut axis, assess their understanding, respond appropriately, you want to involve the patient in the treatment options and remain con commitment to continued care. Don't abandon the patient in the pain and then keep the, the what Carl Rogers would talk about, positive regard and empathy and engage with the patient to achieve satisfaction. Uh, we just have a book coming out with Johanna Ruddy. Uh, she's the executive director of the Rome Foundation. We collaborated on this to provide a collaborative patient doctor perspective. I would recommend it uh, for your patients and also for providers. So thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Drossman, for that fantastic presentation. Rounding out our presentations for today is Dr. Miranda Van Tilburg. Dr. Van Tilburg is a professor of clinical research at Campbell University adjunct professor of medicine at the University of North Carolina and affiliate associate professor of social work at the University of Washington. Dr. Ben Tilburg is a health psychologist by training and her research focuses on developing and testing psychological treatments for DGBIs. Dr. Ben Tilburg will be presenting on brain gut therapies.
Thank you very much for this introduction. Um, well, we're going to talk about brain gut therapies today. Um, of course, there are many different brain gut therapies. We often think of brain gut therapies as psychological therapy, and there's a lot of evidence for them. Um, first of all, there's cognitive behavioral therapy. Lots of evidence of cognitive behavioral therapy can help patients with DGBI, specifically those with abdominal pain, and um, in both adults and in pediatrics. And in cognitive behavioral therapy, we address how people feel, think, and behave when they're in pain. Um, exposure therapy is a very special type of cognitive behavioral therapy. And here we really um, deal with people fe facing fears related around their symptoms. For example, people not wanting to leave their house or not going anywhere where they don't have access to toilets. And we're sort of trying to remove that avoidance behavior. Then we've all probably heard about hypnosis. Um, hypnosis is highly effective, uh, probably even more than CBT. And um, here we use focused attention to increase suggestibility. And when we increase suggestibility, people can make their own cha uh, changes, not only emotionally, but also physiologically. And then there's some increasing evidence that mindfulness can work, specifically in irritable bowel syndrome. And in mindfulness, we are aware of our symptoms, but we don't react to them. So we, we teach uh, patients to uh, notice that they may, may be bloated or that they may have abdominal pain, but not be fearful about them, not start thinking about what they need to do next, etc. Just notice them and sit with them. There are many other brain, brain gut therapies um, sort of on the horizon that we don't have as much evidence for yet. There's still some conflicting evidence on whether yoga might be effective. Um, we've used biofeedback, of course, in dyssynergic defecation, but there might also be some evidence that helps with chronic pain. Neurostimulation is a new kid on the block, specifically for uh, pediatric abdominal pain and nausea. And there's some evidence that virtual reality might be really helpful for chronic pain. I will not be addressing these because I sort of feel like these are a preliminary. And then of course, their brain gut uh, ther therapies also includes neuromodulators that Dr. Drosman just talked about. Now, when I was preparing this talk, I was thinking about what can I give to you that is truly new and maybe insightful. And I was thinking if I just give you to uh, talk to you about the effectiveness of all of these um, therapies, not only will I run way out of time, <laughs> but you probably already know this. These therapies, especially the psychological therapies that we have evidence on, um, are highly effective. It doesn't matter whether we deliver them in person, um, in a group, um, by internet, self-administered over the phone, they seem to be always effective. Um, this is a study in adults, but uh, or a meta-analysis of more than 40 trials with over 4,000 patients um, just published in 2020. And it shows that it's effective over weight list control, but also over, most of them are effective against an education control. We have similar data in pediatrics, this is adults. But what I really want to talk to you about today is to sort of think about, okay, we know these are effective, but why are they effective? And you might say, well, that, the brain good access, right? We've heard about this, we've talked about it today. Dr. Seps, Dr. Drosman talked about it today. But how are we really proposing that these brain good therapies might work? Usually we're proposing that if we change the brain, that that will uh, influence the gut. We're not really talking about the other way around. We're usually saying, let's change the brain so we can change the gut. And that sort of is this idea that, there, that this could be a cure or it's a cause of pain. We can also talk about, sometimes we talk about, um, well, perhaps psychological therapies aren't really meant to change the gut, like change the, sim the gut symptoms, but they're, they're meant to change the disability around um, the symptoms. So it's more like a band-aid, like, okay, we cannot maybe perhaps influence your gut, but we could definitely influence how you cope and manage with your symptoms, and that would increase your quality of life and reduce your disability. And of course, there's the idea that, that um, there's a true brain-gut bidirectional interaction. And so the brain is just one cog in a very complex system 
and in an interaction that I think Dr. Dorsman already talked about in his talk. So, but however, when we look at the literature, what we see is that a lot of times we are testing this number one and number two instead of truly testing number three. And um, we see this a lot. Over 90% of papers that have been uh, published on psychological factors include anxiety and depression and nothing else. It's sort of like we're saying, hey, you look anxious, you might be stressed, this might be why you have symptoms. And let me get some um, examples of that. If we think about uh, the, the brain as a cause for the gut symptoms, or perhaps not, you know, the gut causing the brain, then we think about which came first, right? This chicken and egg problem. And there's multiple studies about this. This is a study in 2017, fairly recent by Jones and Tally Group. And um, here they've shown that for those who are healthcare seekers, anxiety, a diagnosis of anxiety comes before a diagnosis of a, of a DBGI in about two thirds of the patients, but they couldn't find this relationship in a population study showing that perhaps there might not be a cause and effect here. However, the results and how we interpret them is not what I'm most interested in, in showing you. I want you to keep this methodology and sort of the question in mind, and I'll get back to it later. Let me give a second exa example. So psychological factors have also been thought about, you know, not maybe directly influencing gut symptoms, but definitely influencing how we deal with the disorder. So lots of studies, this one from 2020, again, very recent out of Sweden showing that if you have anxiety or depression, yes, you're more likely to seek healthcare, but not GI healthcare. I'm not, again, not going to get into sort of what this means, but just sort of focus on the question, right? This is that band-aid thing, like, okay, does it influence the illness presentation? And it gets me back to that brain-gut interaction. Like, what are we really proposing here? We're proposing here the brain influences the gut or how we respond to gut symptoms. And believe it or not, that is not the biopsychosocial model that we're often talking about and we pay a lot of lip service to. It is the biomedical model because the biomedical model actually allows for psychological influences on GI diseases. So in the biomedical model, we propose that it's either the brain or the body that influences the disease. So that's where the first time these psychological factors come in. If it's not the body, it must be the brain, right? And then once we know you have a disease, let's say you have diabetes, then how you manage that disease, you know, can be influenced by psychological factors. And this is sort of this Band-Aid idea. So in, in this biomedical model, you'll see we allow for these types of studies and we test these types of interactions. They're not truly a biopsychosocial approach. Where does this biomedical model come from and what's sort of the harmful part of it? Well, the harmful part of it is we separate the body and the mind. And it comes from Descartes, who was a 17th century uh, mathematician and philosopher. He was not a medical doctor, wasn't interested in medicine necessarily, but he came up with this brilliant idea. Before that time, we, everybody sort of saw the body as a vessel of God and we weren't allowed to open it up and study it. But he said, well, no, it's really not. The body is just a machine and we can open it and we can study it. And um, it's the mind where God lives, it's our soul. And so we need to protect that. And that opened up so many um, opportunities and so much knowledge. So it really did a lot of good, but it's not the model we practice under today because if now in the biomedical model, if something's wrong with your body, we say you're sick. If something's wrong with your mind, we kind of tell people they're crazy, right? In people's minds, it's not what we directly do as healthcare providers, but keep that in the back of your mind. And this is something that I've learned from Dr. Grossman when um, I started 
really being interested in GI diseases is that the problem becomes this way. If we think about disease, disease is the biology, like something's wrong with you, your pancreas doesn't work, you're, you know, you have an infection. And then we think about illnesses, the symptoms you report, a disability you have, etc. If you have a disease and you're symptomatic, you have illness, then you're rightfully suffering. We would never say um, to a cancer patient or chemotherapy that they should just shut up and go on with their lives. If you have no disease and no illness and you're healthy, so we're all in agreement about that works phenomenally. But if illness and disease don't agree, that's where the problems come in. So if you have a patient who comes in, has been having reflux, really severe reflux, pretty much their whole life, never were symptomatic, but now they got esophageal cancer due to that reflux, we say, well, that's, we admire that person. That's a very stoic person. They're really good about coping with their disease. And what we're kind of telling them is, we don't believe you. You had symptoms this whole time. You just didn't want to tell us because you were so stoic. So we kind of don't believe the patient. On the other hand, when people come in and they have no disease, they have a lot of symptoms, illness behaviors, we tell them they're psychosomatic. And in that, that's often interpreted as these people are a little crazy because they're making things up. It must be all in their mind. And this is so entrenched in our culture that it's really hard for us as healthcare providers and clinicians and researchers to sort of take a step away and say, what are we really testing, the biomedical model or the biopsychosocial model, that imagine how hard it is for our patients. And I wanted to give you an example of this. This is the New York Times. It's a blog written by a pediatrician. She sees patients with pain all the time. She went out and she interviewed people who are experts on um, child pain. And even after all of that, this is what she writes down. When it comes to my own children, I start with denial. Oh, it's not serious. Oh, they exaggerate. They're just making a fuss. In other words, they're crazy, right? It, but then she says, oh, and then I flip and I think, bah, it must be meningitis and we need a, a spinal step. In other words, it's the body. So it's this body-mind thing that even if for this trained person who's gone out and talked to the experts, still very hard to get away from that because it is so entrenched in, into our culture. And this is really important for us to realize when we're talking with our patients. We can explain the biopsychosocial model for them but it remains strange. And we kind of have to work within the biomedical model to convince them about this brain gut interaction, et cetera. So when a patient comes in and we say they have no biomedical uh, cause for symptoms, I'm sort of, you know, this is kind of old school to say this, but, I'll, but you know, it still happens that we say that we cannot find anything wrong on any tests. The clinician might think, well, the cause is the brain, right? It must be in the brain. We have these wonderful brain gut therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy. Let me send them to a psychologist. It will really help them because we have this evidence for it. So in the clinician's mind, we're on the mind part of the problem. The patient sort of agrees with the uh, physician. They said, yeah, if you can't find anything, it must be the mind. However, I know I am not crazy. So to me, this means it's not my mind. It's you didn't do a good enough job to find the true cause. And that's a really hard thing to deal with. And that's why we see people going from multiple um, visits to multiple doctors, etc. Very briefly, I'm just going to touch upon this very briefly because I think Dr. Saps and Drosman already done this very um, uh, thoroughly with you, but how do you get out of this, right? You can get out of it with more testing. So reinsurance that their symptoms are real. You believe them, they're true symptoms to a patient that believes there must be a biological cause. And we're going to tell them, yes, they're not just all in your head. There are some physiological mechanisms by which you could be um, having these symptoms. And then it comes down to education about the brain gut axis, but really, truly, I wanna emphasize, 
the patient is going to be in this biomedical model. So they're going to see it as here you have the brain and look, if you're in love, you have butterflies. And now they go like, yes, I understand that. So the brain can influence the gut, et cetera. Um, if you introduce psychological care to them, the most important thing for you to say is that it can help them manage their symptoms. If you tell them that this is to cure them or this is the main reason for it, this will their GI symptoms will disappear from this, they'll, they'll just immediately go to you. Well, you think it's my mind and you think I'm crazy. So, so really uh, emphasize, you know, we, we're sending you here because this will, can help you manage your symptoms and then that could potentially decrease some of your symptoms. It's one part of the treatment plan. Um, ideally, you show by your behaviors that you mean what you say. And by that is you incorporate a psychologist on your team and you remain available as long as that person is in psychological treatment. Because if you don't, if you just send them out and then you say, see ya, um, you can have done a phenomenal explanation of the brain cut axis and you know reassure them that you didn't think it was in their head. But that behavior would still show to the patient, ah, that was a lie. You really do believe I'm crazy. Hence, they won't follow up with this uh, treatment advice. So what is the biopsychosocial model? I think most of you will notice, but, but since I've just been sort of hammering on, hey, the biomedical model also allows for psychological symptoms to influence the gut or influence the disease. Um, what is the biopsychosocial model? Well, the biopsychosocial model is sort of this um, systems model, right? We're in a system and biological factors and psychosocial factors influence each other constantly, all the time over and over. There's not no reason for us to say which one came first. It's more important that they're here, all of them right now, and they influence each other and both of them need treatment. A true systems approach is really hard to study. So that's why we usually sort of pull things apart. We don't have the statistical modeling to do, do, do and, and it's really difficult to design studies for a system, for a system approach study. So that's why we usually pull them apart. I didn't want to take these two studies at the beginning and tell them they did it wrong. It's just that if you look at them, they could both fit within the biomedical model as well as the biopsychosocial model. And then probably these authors were thinking they tested the biopsychosocial model, but they pulled it so much apart that it's hard to see that anymore. So if we truly do believe in the biopsychosocial model, then why are we only thinking about brain gut therapies? We should be thinking about gut brain therapies. And for a very long time, we weren't really thinking about those. Um, but with sort of the, the new kid on the block, the microbiota, we, we're starting to really be excited about how the microbiota can influence the brain. So for example, this is a study out of UCLA where they gave healthy volunteers a probiotic yogurt, and then they showed that if they gave them a task while they were doing an fMRI, that the brain um, of those who drank the yogurt had less um, effective and sensory um, activation than those who did not. And this can also be seen in our patients. This was just a small study, but I think it's really exciting because it shows that if you give a probiotic to a patient with irritable bowel syndrome, you not only might be affecting their gut symptoms, you can actually find a reduction in depression. So we need to do both. We need to do brain gut as well as gut brain studies if we really truly test a biopsychosocial model. Coming back to my question way from the beginning, why are these psychological therapies helping? Um, so what's the mechanism of brain gut treatment? And there's been some studies, not a lot, but a few studies who've looked at that. We know that if we do CPT, for example, or hypnosis, that we have changes in gut symptoms, we have changes in anxiety and depression, we have changes in you know, uh, brain connectivity, we have changes in visceral hypersensitivity, et cetera. But do these really, um, are these the mechanism of the treatment, right? Or are these sort of bystanders who react, who changed as well just because the pain changed? And the studies have shown that actually the anxiety and depression as well as stress are not the mechanism by which these psychological therapies work. 
The main mechanisms that have been found so far is a reduction in catastrophizing, a reduction in how anxious people are about their symptoms, not how anxious they are in general, but anxious, anxious about the symptoms specifically, and then a reduction again in those avoidance behaviors to avoid becoming symptomatic. Emphasizing again that biological factors have been tested but, and found to change in therapy, but the gut-related factors, we really don't know what they mean currently if they're a mechanism of this brain-gut um, treatment. And that's definitely something we need to discover. So in summary, both brain-gut and gut-brain therapies can reduce symptoms. The good evidence for cognitive behavioral therapy, hypnosis, mindfulness, and also probiotics. There's many others on the block, and we'll probably see exciting new research coming out. Brain mechanisms by which these work so far we found is a reduction in catastrophizing, avoidance, and, and GI-specific pain. The gut mechanism so far unknown, although we propose it's probably true the microbiota and how they affect our immune system and then our brains. And then um, the last thing I wanna just say, we all live in a culture that still is deeply drowned into this biomedical model. And many clinicians, even researchers, and definitely our patients will adhere to the biomedical model and education about the biopsychosocial model will be very, very important. And I just want to leave you with this one. Hopefully that will give you a laugh at the end of this long evening. And thank you so much. I'll be happy to take any questions. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Ben Tilber, for that wonderful presentation. We will now move on to the Q&A portion of our symposia. I would ask that all of the panelists turn your mic and video on. Um, we have a number of excellent questions submitted here, but the question and answer uh, box will remain open through this portion. Um, the first question will go to uh, Dr. Sops, and that is, are any of the central, modula central modulators prescribed for pediatric patients? Yeah, in fact, we use them all the time. And the patient that I uh, show you, the one that um, had ABS, we use amitriptyline. So, uh, we frequently use uh, tricyclic antidepressants. We also use uh, less frequently, but we use um, uh, uh We also use azapirones like buspirone. Uh, we, it depends on the situation. We use them different drugs. We use uh, delta ligands like um, um, gabapentin and uh, pregabalin. The, the issue is whether there is enough evidence in pediatrics. And for in pediatrics, we the one that was uh, mostly studied was uh, uh, amitriptyline, but we could talk a lot about all of them and we use them all the time, yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, the next question um, will go, go to Dr. Van Tolberg, or Dr. Sops, you may want to um, answer after her as well, um, if you have additional input to the question, why is there a seasonal effect of abdominal pain? Is it related to weather or is it related to school, which is also seasonal? So um, I thought I would answer this question because we actually run a study to look at this and it was a small study. We, we need follow up um, information on this, but we looked at whether it was changes in sleep, changes in activity, changes in infection rate, changes in um, all kinds of things, uh, how the parents responded to their children. And it was all by self-report, we did it, but we found that those, um, children who change their abdominal pain from winter to, to summer, because not all of them do, but those who change, the only change that was associated with that change in pain was a change in anxiety. So definitely, I think some, we need more studies and we need more sophisticated um, methods that we used in our study. But I think we at least have some evidence that anxiety is one of the culprits. Excellent. So we did some uh, some studies and in uh, different cities, some of them, uh, including Orlando and um, some places where there was different weather, and we found the same effect uh, in the northern states and the more southern states in the U.S. Although there was some moderation, uh, some changes with that, but 
uh, we found the same effect in, in all of them. So we think it's probably related to the school year, to the stress, uh, either stress or maybe, as I mentioned before, maybe other factors, maybe diet changes also. Uh, maybe there may be some infections from that um, there are uh, subclinical that just from being in, in close contact among children, but there is something about the effect of being in the school year compared with the summer month. And interesting, when we look at the microbiome, uh, also, we, we compare uh, whether there was, a, as I mentioned, the school year or the summertime, and we also found these differences. Um, and we controlled for the uh, winter summer effect. Excellent. Our next question will go to Dr. Drossman. And the question is, for TCA therapy, do you start at 25 milligrams at night? And also, when do you increase this and to what dose? 50 milligrams? Um, seems like a pretty steep increase. Can you discuss? Sure. Um, I think it, it again depends on which antidepressant you're using. So if we're using the tertiary amines like amitriptyline and amipramine, as I said, they're dirty drugs. So patients don't usually tolerate rapid increases. I would start at 25, but sometimes I start at 50 if I'm using disipramine or nortriptyline because they don't have as much difficulty with side effects. In our, in our NIH study, we went from 50 to 150 of disipramine and 150 was a bit too much, but we could get away with 100 milligrams uh, simply because it, it, you could get maximum benefit at that dose without all the side effects. So if you're gonna go with tri uh, amitriptyline, you're treating also the diarrhea as well as the pain, and you can go 25, 50, maybe 75. With, with the secondary amines, you can go up to 100. And, and I would increase it usually every week or two because the side effects come out the first day, the first few days. So you'll know if they're getting side effects or not. And if not, go to your target dose. Excellent. Um, and I believe we have one more question here. It's do, you, and I think Dr. Drossman, this may be to you, do you routinely do an ECG before starting amitriptyline? Tagged on to that last question. Oh, yes, uh, we do. What we don't do is uh, a follow-up, um, a, a second EKG after we, uh, we treat, because we we look in the amitriptyline study whether there were uh, enough changes in the QTC after using amitriptyline and we didn't find that there was a significant difference. So we, but yes, we, we always do. Um, some people don't, but I, I wanna be safe and I wanna, I document that we, we did it. Okay. And I think in adults, it, it, it's really, uh, it's a cost effective issue. Uh, if it's, do you wanna do it in a younger person? Um, generally we don't, um, but if I'm using, expecting to use high dose of amitriptyline, where there's more of that effect then I might do it, but generally I do not um, because the, the evidence is, is quite, with the doses we're using, we are not using psychiatric doses. We're using not 250 or 300 milligrams of a tricyclic to treat depression. We're using one fourth the dose. So we tend not to do it just from a standpoint of cost economy. I believe we are at our time mark for this evening. Um, any unanswered questions will be available on Doc Matter, including the question I think we all have about how we can get one of those emoji pillows that Dr. Drosman has in his office. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> a sincere thank you to both our presenters and all of the attendees who came uh, this evening. We hope that you enjoyed the presentation and we look forward to seeing you at the next virtual symposia session of the series on Wednesday, December 2nd at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which will focus on pelvic floor dysfunction. And again, all of these extra questions um, that weren't answered will be on jockmatter.com to continue the conversation. Thank you all again.